I'm Aaron David Miller, and this is Carnegie Connects. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. I truly hope you are sound, safe, and above all, healthy. I'm Aaron David Miller, a senior fellow with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and welcome to Carnegie Connects, a set of virtual discussions, for at least for now, and I suspect for some time into the future, on issues of critical importance to America and to the world. Today, I'm very pleased to host a friend, um, Kurt Campbell, Deputy Assistant to the President and Coordinator for Indo-Pacific Affairs in the National Security Council. Kurt's had a distinguished career uh, in government, diplomacy, the think tank world, and the private sector. You may or may not agree with this, but I suspect he may have inherited his most challenging assignment dealing with the United States and China um, uh, in the current administration. Kurt, uh, let me welcome you to Carnegie Connects and wish you again a very happy and healthy new year. We have a lot of ground to cover, so let's jump right in. Um, Evan Feigenbaum, my Carnegie colleague, who's going to forget more about China than I'm ever going to know, believes in order to get China right, you need to get Asia right. Now, you've been in the job for a year, and a year at least in administration time. Uh, whether that's a uh, lengthy increment of time with respect to Asian time is another matter. But if you could explain to us, what do you think uh, the Biden administration has gotten right uh, with respect to Asia and the Indo-Pacific, and perhaps what more needs to be done? Aaron, well, first of all, let me just uh, say thank you. Thank you for having me on your show. It's uh, widely watched, uh, well regarded. I'm appreciative for the opportunity to engage with you directly. I'm sitting here. It's today is January 6th, the, a year after uh, the tragedy that it took place at the Capitol. Uh, we're in the middle of COVID, so enormous challenges. I'm here in the old executive office building. Uh, and uh, grateful for the opportunity to at least engage with you virtually. Let me just begin by saying that I very much agree with uh, uh, your colleague and my friend Evan when he describes the uh, necessity of getting Asia right if you're going to want to get China right. And I would actually take that even a step back. In many respects, Aaron, we're going to have to get the United States right uh, as a precondition for effective engagement in the Indo-Pacific. And let me explain um, what I mean here. I, I think um, we are uh, in a period in which the ability for the United States to basically make clear that our model of uh, democracy, that our approach to global politics, that our domestic vitality is intact, is an essential feature in our overall ability to make the case that the United States is going to continue to play a role as a or the leading nation on the global stage. And so I think what the president has tried to do from the outset is to articulate a comprehensive, multifaceted um, uh, uh, sort of a, a role for the United States, both domestically and in the world. So I think, number one, the president tried to articulate that making sure that we're making critical investments domestically in our infrastructure, in technology. I would argue, and Aaron, we can talk about this in a moment, that the ramparts, the areas in which we're going to need to compete in the Indo-Pacific are not necessarily just in military uh, sort of competitions but across arenas of technology, 5G, uh, quantum computing, robotics, human sciences. And the president and others are seeking to make those investments domestically. But it's also important for us to demonstrate a common purpose, Aaron, across the political aisle. And I will say one of the heartening things that I found over the uh, course of the last year is that there is more bipartisan agreement and understanding that the lion's share of the history of the 21st century is going to be written in Asia, in the Indo-Pacific, 
and that we're going to be able uh, uh, to work together on issues of common purpose across the region as a whole. And so I think Democrats and Republicans have worked more effectively on China and the Indo-Pacific than on, on almost any other foreign policy and national security issue. So I would say um, to your initial comment, getting the United States right, making sure that we have what it takes to compete is the essential precondition of doing anything. And I think secondly, what Evan is describing is an effort that I think the administration has taken on in a comprehensive fashion, which is to engage partners and friends around the world, not just in Asia, not just our security partners like Japan and Australia and South Korea and new partners like Vietnam and India, but countries in Europe, uh, uh, how to think uh, constructively, uh, helpfully about constructing a strategy uh, for the Indo-Pacific. I think one of the things that we've discussed before, Aaron, is that everything that the United States has really ever done of purpose on the global stage, we have done with Europe and the Indo-Pacific will not be an exception. And so one of the things that we've seen over the course of the last several months is a deepening of dialogue and discussion with European friends around the challenges in the Indo-Pacific. So those are the initial preconditions. Um, getting our domestic house in order, which frankly, that's a long-term, never-ending set of challenges. Working with allies and partners. And you've seen that both in bilateral engagements, more comprehensively in Europe, and also in new forums like the Quad, like AUKUS, we can talk more about them going forward and working more actively in international organizations. That's what Evan is describing about setting the context for the bilateral engagement between the United States and China. You know, domestic renewal is critical as are, as is the issue of uh, creating uh, new partnerships with friends and allies. So if those are the two, those are two main ingredients, what do you think we've missed with respect to overall policy on Asia and, and the Indo-Pacific before we turn to China, but just yeah, on well, the general on the general picture. First of all, Aaron, I'm not sure there's anything that we miss because I think this is a process that's going to take a substantial period of time. One of the things that the president has articulated in his engagements with multilateral fora like APEC and the ASEAN Regional Forum, these are groupings of Indo-Pacific states is he has articulated clearly that the United States needs to play a role with respect to the economic framing, the commercial engagement, the trade practices in the Indo-Pacific. That's an area where the United States indeed needs to step up its game. We've got to make clear that not only are we deeply engaged diplomatically, militarily, comprehensively, strategically, that we have an open, engaged, optimistic approach to commercial interactions, investment in the Indo-Pacific. This is not just traditional trade. This also has to do with digital engagement. It also has to do with standard settings with new capacities associated with technology and the like. Those are all areas where the United States is going to have to continue to step up its game. I think we well understand inside the Biden administration that 2022 will be about these engagements comprehensively across the region. I watched an interview that you gave to the Asia Society uh, in July uh, with Danny Russell and um, and Kevin Rudd, um, and you you made the the assertion, and we're going to return to the issue of economic engagement, that if you want to, you needed to you needed to get a ticket to the big game. It wasn't enough just to securitize American policy, but you really did need to buy a ticket to the big game and compete economically. I want to return to that point uh, when a little later on in the discussion, but I want to go to China now. And and um, I'm not asking you to be a sinologist, um, but I think it's fair to argue that sound policy flows from sound analysis, even though honest analysis can often lead to paralysis. Um, looking back my, on my own experience as an intelligence analyst and in, and in negotiations, when we failed, it was almost always a consequence of looking at the world the way we wanted it to be rather than the way it actually was. So I want to ask you three short questions analytically. Um, number one, 
what what is the primary assumption on which the administration bases its policies toward China's ambitions and and interests? There appears to be a debate between those who argue that China is a wholesale revisionist power eager to overturn the system, challenge, if not replace the United States. Uh, on the part of some, others argue that no, that's not really a fair explanation and hasn't yet been demonstrated that it's more a strategic revisionist. It wants primacy in certain areas, but has no illusions about recreating a system or exporting little Chinas all over the world. So how do you see that question of what does China want? Well, the, the general proposition of the Biden administration is that the dominant paradigm between the United States and China is uh, increasingly going to be defined by competition, Aaron, and that fundamentally uh, we believe that it's possible to work with China in a way in which the defining characteristic is competition, but we will compete in areas that will maximize the positives in our own society in terms of innovation and the like. And we will seek to take steps to prevent certain aspects of that competition veering into dangerous areas in terms of military uh, inadvertent or you know accidental encounters between the United States and China. So I think our dominant paradigm is the recognition that we're entering a period in which competition essentially is the feature that animates the relationship between the United States and China. The question of what China wants or where China is headed is one that's been debated, as you know, for decades, a century. I would simply say that I think what we are seeing increasingly are steps that China is taking that are antithetical to the maintenance of the operating system in Asia. And if you would ask what the operating system of the Indo-Pacific, what, what does that rest on? It rests on peaceful resolution of disputes, open interpretations on how we you know, uh, conduct our business affairs. There, there are general rules of the world that have led to the greatest you know, accumulation of wealth and left, lifting people out of poverty over the course of the last 40 or 50 years. The United States and China, in many respects, have worked together in uh, elements of sustaining that system. What we have seen of late, particularly under President Xi Jinping, are a number of de uh, developments, both domestically, but also internationally, that does suggest that in many instances, Aaron, that China is a revisionist power and seeks changes in the system to advantage China, perhaps in ways that are antithetical to the interests of other countries in the Indo-Pacific. And so what we've seen over the course of the last couple of years are um, you know, economic steps taken against Australia, more assertive military actions in the South China Sea, across the Taiwan Straits, in the East Sea, aimed at China, um, robust, dangerous military actions uh, along the border with India, wolf warrior diplomacy, much more aggressive uh, across Europe. A number of steps that suggests that China is challenging elements of this operating system that I think, frankly, are, is in the interest not only of the United States and other countries in the region, but frankly, of China itself. And so I, I think the fundamental questions um, about what China uh, ultimately wants, I'm not sure can be effectively answered ultimately, but what we are seeing in the near term are specific steps that frankly we feel are unsettling and destabilizing uh, what we believe is an operating system in Asia that has served our and the, uh, the interests of our partners. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm heartened by the fact that the analysis remains uh, very much in play. Um, and because if, in fact, domination or primacy um, becomes the objective, then the real question is how much space is there really going to be? Yeah. If Aaron, U.S. seeks I, primacy I, I, in Asia, how yeah, much I, space I, is there going to be? I don't need? hear that. I, and, and frankly, I, I, I don't hear that in debates and discussions internally or with others. In fact, um, I, what I hear a lot of is, is sustaining a system 
of partners and friends working in concert with other countries. I do not believe this is about American domination. In fact, I believe ultimately what the United States seeks is a kind of coexistence with China, with an understanding of China's critical and important role. And I do want to just underscore, Aaron, look, look China's um, rise, its its uh, position on the global stage is a remarkable achievement over the last 40 or 50 years. And it is due largely to the hard work of the Chinese people, tremendous innovation, the circumstances that have led to um, a, a remarkable accumulation of national power. But it is also the case that the United States has played a critical role in helping China grow and prosper. We have created and helped support uh, peace and prosperity across the Indo-Pacific. We have kept largely our markets open. We've invested in China. We've opened up our universities to Chinese students. We've worked closely with a succession of Chinese leaders on issues uh, in which we think that we can work in, in, in uh, common purpose on the global stage. And so unlike previous periods in which largely leading states have sought to uh, block the arrival of another power on the global stage. In many respects, the United States has supported China in some of those efforts. I think what is different now is that the character of Chinese power for perhaps a variety of reasons has changed over the course of the last decade. Probably some of it has to do with um, Xi Jinping, perhaps there are other factors that come to play, but fundamentally, I, the United States is not, this is not about the United States seeking uh, global domination. This no, I, is, I, yeah. Right, I, I, I accept that point. I, I, I do want to get back to the issue, though, and we have, we have a very difficult time um, because of our own uh, lost primacy in our efforts to regain it in according to other nations and countries, uh, the reality that they in fact have legitimate interests as well. So somewhere in between our search for primacy, uh, asserting our power and achieving our objectives in China, the real question is whether or not there is a balance of interest there that will create a situation where each side would actually accept the legitimacy, not just recognize the legitimacy as an analytical point, but accept the legitimacy of uh, of certain interests based on history and geography. But we'll, we'll return to that in a minute. Uh, one last an analytical question, since you raised the issue of, um, of, of President Xi. Um, there's been a lot of uh, talk and back and forth about whether, whether he is a new kind of Chinese leader, that he fundamentally differs from his five post-Mao predecessors uh, in his ambitions, in the scope of his aspirations. He's been described by some as a man in a hurry, um, seeking power internally, but also abroad. Um, after a year in, what is your assessment? Uh, do we have a Xi problem here or a China problem, or is it, a, is it an irrelevant point to raise? Look, I, uh, I, I'll just give you just a couple of just um, initial thoughts here, Aaron. I, I think one of the things that we have seen over the course of the last several years is the accumulation of power in the hands of one person, that a number of steps have been taken, the disassembly of elements of collective leadership, that as you suggest, that a succession of Chinese leaders had painstakingly put together to ensure that big decisions were subjected to careful party and leadership uh, uh, discussion and analysis. And, and in fact, in, in many respects, the decision about leadership and who will serve as a, a leader of China, one of the key criteria has often been, will that leader be prepared to sustain elements of collective leadership? Over the last 10 years, President Xi has essentially disassembled most of those elements of collective leadership. And I would say that I think it's we're on fairly safe ground, Aaron, when we suggest that most every decision taken in China today 
is taken uh, by President Xi, perhaps with, you know, we, we don't know as much about who he consults and, and, you know, how he interacts more directly. But but power, uh, more and more power is, is held uh, in his hands. Uh, uh, I think one of the things that we're concerned by and we worry about is that in a system like China's system where so much power is held in the hands of one person that 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 feedback and uh, you know the ability to get uh, contrary uh, uh, opinions and advice listened to becomes more complicated. So we worry, for instance, that some of the feedback loops in China perhaps are not working as effectively as they have in the past. And increasingly, that it, that you know almost every decision uh, uh, leads back uh, to President Xi Jinping. And, and, and so this is a system that an incredibly complex, sophisticated country is essentially being managed and directed by the, you know, the uh, perspectives and views of one person, one man, President Xi Jinping. Uh, before we get to the question of what, uh, of how to deal with China, I want to ask you one more question about the past. I think I know the answer. But... The, Critics have argued that there's a lot of continuity between the policies pursued by the Biden administration and its predecessor. Um, if asked that question, um, how would you answer? What 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 are the, the fundamental differences that separate the current administration's approach from China, toward China, from uh, your predecessors? So, so Aaron, the, the truth is there is much more bipartisanship and tradition of building on uh, issues from the past in the Indo-Pacific than perhaps in other regions. So, for instance, when President Biden decided that he wanted to double down at a leader level on the so-called Quad, the collection of the United States, Australia, India and Japan, maritime democracies committed to uh, free and open Indo-Pacific, he was building on a tradition first established by President George W. Bush in 2003 when the Quad originated in the aftermath of the tragic tsunami uh, that struck Indonesia, but also the work that took place in um, the Trump administration. So there are elements of continuity. I would suggest, though, that there are important areas of difference. If you look carefully at some of the elements of the Indo-Pacific approach of the um, Trump administration, I would say that they, you know, it, it, they were all across the board in a number of different areas. They took on a number of countries, a lot of criticism, not just of China, but of Vietnam, of Japan and other countries over the uh, you know, a, a number of particular issues. I think what the, the biggest differentiator between um, the Trump administration and the Biden administration is a recognition that this is not something that we're going to do, you know, alone, and that this is some sort of a bilateral engagement between um, the leader of the United States and the leader of China, or just between two of our countries. This is a larger uh, engagement in which we need to work with allies and partners. And so the most consequential element of our China policy, as Evan indicated, is in the region surrounding China, working with allies and partners on common approaches, exp you know, sharing perspectives, ensuring that we're working for common purposes that is that are not about, you know, uh, American primacy, but again, sustaining this operating system of the Indo-Pacific more generally. So I, I think that is the essential difference between how uh, the Trump administration and the Biden administration has approached. I think the hope is over time, we will be systematic and careful and we will lay out our overall approach in a way that we believe is comprehensive and consistent. And I think some elements of the Trump uh, uh, approach uh, 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 didn't appear as as coordinated or as uh, 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 as integrated as it might, and I think the the key will be for the Biden administration to be both consistent, purposeful, effective, determined, but also bipartisan. 
And that's one of the, I think, key features of our overall approach in the Indo-Pacific. You know, I'm all for bipartisanship too, but as you know, uh, and we're going to get to the issue of domestic politics, bipartisanship on China can often constrain, as it does, I think, with respect to constraining the degree to which we can participate economically uh, in trade deals in Asia. But we'll return to that to, to that point. So 2022, policy is just another word to describe how we define American interests and how we protect and further them. So if you had to evaluate what our interests are, which basically drive our policy toward China and evaluate how we are, are faring in protecting those interests, how would you do so as you look out uh, over, over the course of 2022? What are the core American interests with respect to China? And how are we doing um, on values, uh, economics, security, in furthering and protecting those interests? Well, look, I, Aaron, I would first begin by saying that the China challenge is multifaceted. And what the United States is facing is a challenge across almost every component of governance and national performance. They challenge us technologically, and some of that challenge is because of, you know, just indigenous Chinese innovation, but part of it is also unfair practices, efforts to steal uh, IP in the United States and elsewhere. I, I think uh, I would be one that would argue that our ability to maintain um, uh, a, a leading role across a variety of innovative technologies is going to be a critical part of the scorecard that we're going to need to both take efforts to invest domestically to ensure that we understand what technologies, again, like 5G that are going to be absolutely essential going forward, but will also mean protecting uh, some of those industries and investments. Uh, we will also need to acknowledge that, that as President Biden has indicated, one of the most important elements of, 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 of the U.S. role on the global stage is, Aaron, to effectively articulate that democracy uh, can still deliver, can still be effective. And although I do, you know, there is a, there's a thriving debate about whether China seeks to export so its model. I, I do think there's very little doubt that there are elements of sort of techno-authoritarianism that, that, that China has indeed exported to other countries. The capability to track, you know, uh, dissident groups, to use technologies on communications and the like to favor authoritarianism. And I think that is undeniable and, that, that, and the best way to deal with that is to ensure that the United States is able to demonstrate its own effectiveness domestically. And I, I would say in that respect, Aaron, the, you know, the jury's still out, that's going to be continuous. But across every sector, uh, commercial, military, the challenge is real. Uh, for instance, uh, you know, no country probably in history has invested as much militarily across the board, ships, airplanes, innovations, as China has over the last 30 years. And that does represent uh, a challenge, not just to the United States, but it has created enormous anxiety in the region as a whole. So what you're asking is, you know, first of all, is the challenge broad-based? It is, it's in every sector. And, and I would be one that argues that, that the United States needs to be effective across all of those sectors, militarily, diplomatically, strategically, as you described, commercially and the like, but also in terms of values and our ability to demonstrate the viability of our own system. Right. We could have this as an agenda, but there is a useful distinction, I would think, between a vital American interest and a discretionary one. I, I and, don't think there'd be any question of that. And if, in fact, we're talking about the world's two most powerful nations, um, it, it would seem to me that identifying what vital American interests are, vital in the sense that a U.S. president would be prepared to put Americans in harm's way, 
essentially uh, spend uh, whatever resources, terror resources are necessary and um, sacrifice our uh, quote unquote credibility. If that's the definition of vital, what then becomes the key one or two vital interests with respect to China? I'm assuming avoiding war um, is, is obviously uh, number one. Uh, that would also pertain with the Russians. But you, we can't do everything, Kurt. And uh, it is broad-based. It's multifaceted. But what is the key challenge, do you think? The key challenge in the U.S.-China relationship, you're asking, Aaron, more directly, I, I think the most important thing for this generation of Americans and for Chinese is to recognize that that coexistence of, of uh, in, in which there are going to be elements that are going to be um, uh, negotiated and engaged is an essential feature of our relationship. And that means defining what are the areas that we have to defend and contend with. One of the things that you have not described, Aaron, one of the one of the features of China's internal strategic thinking about the United States at the leader level and the people around President Xi is a you know constant thinking about sort of the you know the paradox of power, the sort of Marxian balance of, of forces. And many in China believe that the United States is in the midst of a hurtling decline. Right. And that this is late stage capitalism and that this is China's time to assert its role as the new leading state on the global stage. I think the most essential feature right now is to make clear, as in the past, that those who have bet against the United States, that this is a losing proposition, that we have a unique ability to reinvent ourselves, to, to move forward, to compete, and to succeed in areas that, uh, uh, that, that others had underestimated us. So I would say that is the most important ingredient in an effective strategy is ensuring that everyone understands, including the United States, that our leading role will continue on, uh, on the global stage uh, and, and, and that China is making a mistake by seeking to count us out. I also believe, Aaron, that there are elements uh, of, of, the, of our bilateral relationship and uh, global politics that require a degree of constructive engagement between the United States and China. For instance, one of the most effective arenas of diplomacy is in the arena of climate. Uh, you've seen the purposeful hard work of Secretary Kerry, our climate envoy, to get China on board. I think everyone recognized that the most important element of the next 10 years is to bring China more into the global framework uh, associated uh, with climate. To date, they have not taken the necessary steps with respect to coal domestically, but I think continuing to work on that is going to be critical. Secondly, uh, I would argue would be in the arena of non-proliferation. And here, and you, you know this well, the Chinese role in discussions with Iran, negotiations with Iran, but also North Korea is essential. We both share an interest in seeking to ensure that non-proliferation norms are maintained on the global stage. And I think that's going to be uh, a critical importance as we go forward. And third will be, you know, close consultations on regional issues that have mutual interests between our two countries. So maintenance of peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula, trying to manage what's going on in the complex arena in uh, in Myanmar and Burma, I think is a, another, even though we've taken different steps, making sure we have open lines of communication, I think that's going to be of critical importance. So I do believe that it's possible, and this will be difficult for the United States, Aaron, and we don't have a long tradition of this, but we are going to need to both compete assertively, um, purposefully across a number of arenas, but at the same time, maintain constructive, uh, uh, positive and productive discussions with China on issues of mutual import. Right, it, it also, though, Kirk, and I'm all for engagement, although that, that word sort of loses its meaning. Um, it also occurs when administrations are prepared to be risk ready, not risk averse. 
And risk readiness in this case is tethered to some degree to domestic politics, not just to the reality that you have a bipartisanship that in many respects works against Americans' national interests when it comes to participating in trade deals uh, in Asia. I mean, you, you were, you more than anyone understand um, the value of T TPP. Um, so I, I guess the question is, um, and it's hard for an administration in the first year. One could be forgiven for thinking, although it looks pretty bleak with respect to the outcome of, the, of midterms, that any serious policy for, uh, toward China would have to wait until those midterm elections were held. I'm not so sure the results are gonna make it any easier, frankly, for us to engage, engage the Chinese. But to what degree is domestic politics in its um, darkest sense um, or more its most trenchant sense a drag on our ability to take risks, to use your word, to engage China? So, so first of all, Aaron, look, I, I am not a domestic politics practitioner. I, I work in foreign policy, and that's where my primary expertise lies. I, I would simply say that I have found that, again, if you begin where you began, which, as Evan describes, the most important elements right now of China policy is what you do in the surrounding re region. I would suggest to you some of the boldest, most dramatic steps that the Biden administration has taken have been in those areas. The construction of the AUKUS agreement between the United States, Australia, and Great Britain. It's a dramatic step. We've never done anything like this in 70 years. Big step, big, extraordinary achievement to ensure that these three countries will work constructively uh, on the security front to build nuclear submarines and work in other areas. The Quad, Aaron, remember, you know, this is a group that had met at lower levels. We'd never met at the leader level. Uh, we'd never been able to basically articulate a common vision among our four countries. The Quad has met in person twice at the leader level over the course of the last year. This is a very bold step. We made a major commitment that our four countries would deliver a billion doses of vaccines to Southeast Asia. And so I, I would, I, I, I've generally agreed with almost everything that you've said. Where I would disagree with you is that I do not believe that bipartisanship has been a limit to what we can do in the Indo-Pacific. It is, it is an enabler. I have found that in almost everything that we've tried to do in the Indo-Pacific, including careful, um, discreet, um, uh, uh, delineated engagements with China uh, has been welcomed across the board uh, uh, in uh, uh, consultations with uh, Republicans and Democrats. And so I, I, I would take a subtly different view. I think that the key to our effectiveness in the, in the Indo-Pacific is that our broad brush approaches are accepted and uh, supported by a, uh, a broad range of political players uh, here in the United States. Yeah, I, I'd only push back in, in the sense that trade clearly is a highly politicized issue. Yeah. Uh, and it's created a, a good deal of unanimity among Democrats and Republicans. <clears throat> uh, so we're running out of time and, and there are at least two or two or three more issues I want to cover. Um, one is sensitive, and I, I understand this, and that's Taiwan. Um, we continue to assert and abide by our a one China policy. But uh, I think to quote Danny Russell in that Asia Society talk that you gave, Danny said that he had in, sensed a certain hollowing out of the one China policy in the sense that we're, we seem to be moving toward upgrading, uh, not our official relationships, but upgrading a set of contacts we have um, with Taiwan. Uh, and uh, I think most intriguingly uh, was a uh, testimony before Congress um, uh, in which an administration official, I think it was Eli Ratner, talked about Taiwan as a, quote, vital strategic node, <clears throat> the first island chain in Asia. Vital strategic node. That sounds to me like it's a commitment that 
would have to be abided by uh, on the part of the United States. So um, are, are we still following a one China policy? That is to say, could we theoretically accept unification if it's done peacefully? I mean, I suspect I, it's hard for me to imagine such a thing, but is that still our policy? So, Aaron, thank you. As, as you can imagine, this is, as you indicated at the outset, a very sensitive element uh, of national policy. I do want to underscore that our position has not changed. It is consistent with previous approaches. We are committed to the maintenance and peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait. We do have a one China policy. Uh, we support peaceful dialogue and engagement across the Taiwan Strait. We are also committed to trying to improve deterrence to ensure, uh, again, the maintenance of that peace and stability more generally. Um, and you have seen that in every element of what the Biden administration has sought. We have engaged uh, partners in the region to exchange views to ensure that other countries share our commitment in, to the maintenance and peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait. All, all I would uh, just want to underscore uh, to you more generally, we think steadiness, um, careful strategic communication is important, clarity of our perspective to all parties involved. That is what the Biden administration has sought. Uh, uh, a, a, a continuity of policy uh, that has been practiced for decades, we believe is in the best interests of all parties involved. We have tried to communicate uh, those goals and values uh, to all the interested parties. Yeah, it's fair to say, though, I guess, that a democratic polity 100 miles or so off the coast of China with 24 million people uh, is a reality. Um, and there are those who argue that we should strip away the notion of strategic ambiguity and replace it with a sort of strategic clarity. But this gets back to the whole question of what we consider our legitimate interests uh, as opposed to China's and what we're prepared to do, how far we're prepared to go in terms of risk readiness. Um, I, I, I don't envy those who are going to have to deal with this particular issue. We're almost out of time, and I, I, I don't want to leave the discussion without asking you about um, American values. You know, John McCain and I argued with him on this, would assert repeatedly, uh, miss him uh, in many respects, um, that our values were our interests and our interests are our values. It's very compelling. Uh, whether or not it's tethered to reality in the way foreign policy actually works, or in this case, with respect to China. I mean, we have a, we have a foreign policy in which human rights and uh, democracy promotion or support and values play a role. Some would argue we, have a, we should have a human rights policy, but you've been in the business a long time. How do you reconcile with respect to China uh, assuming there is a connection between interest and values, where does it fit mm -hmm. in the in the importance the administration um, devotes to this particular very difficult sort of conundrum? Well, Aaron, I, I very much appreciate the question. As you can imagine, these debates about what role does democracy pr promotion and uh, human rights issue play in the construct of how we engage in the world. I would be of the view that in many respects, it is so intrinsic to who we are that you see it uh, manifested in almost every aspect of our policy. Um, I, I also, you know, as a person who deals uh, regularly with Asia, uh, the, the Indo-Pacific, this is not, you know, questions of you know, democracy being challenged or human rights. This is not just an issue in any one country. It's across the region in many respects. I, I, I would say I, I recognize in the current environment a degree of humility, being humble about some of the challenges that we're facing, recognizing that some of the biggest challenges to democracy on the global stage are occurring here in the United States, recognizing that clearly is going to be important. And so for me, what I find heartening 
are discussions and dialogues with other democratic countries about the modern contemporary challenges that we share as we seek to govern. And clearly there is a competition of models with authoritarian practices, countries that are able to move perhaps more quickly, you know, decisively without as much consultation. At, the, at, at, at a time 20 years ago when, Aaron, when, when you and I first had these discussions about democracy, when it was, there was a sense that, that, you know, nothing could stand in the way of our model of organization. Now, in, in many places, there are questions about our performance. And I think ultimately, right. ultimately right. for me, um, this is not so much about an external effort about what we promote and how we, you know, disseminate, but much more about how we perfect and work domestically at home. Are we able to take the corrective steps to acknowledge our own shortcomings? And it is through those practices in many respects that we animate and affect our, how other countries see it, see us. And so for me, it really is about our domestic example right now in the Indo-Pacific more than anything else. I think that's a telling point. And, and again, unsolicited advice. When we engage on human rights, I think we should do it in conjunction with partners. Yes. We should be consistent to the extent that we can be. And we should recognize that we live in a glass house now to a greater extent than we have in any time that I can remember. Yes. Uh, well, so, Aaron, very well said. Fixing it, America's it, broken house, Kurt, is critical. Well, let's end where we began. Uh, on, a, on a very seminal day uh, and a, sem a seminal co commemoration. Um, I just want to thank you for coming, Kurt. I know uh, you're busy, and uh, more than that, uh, you basically have put up with my annoyingly negative questions for 45 minutes, and I really do appreciate it, Kurt. Aaron, it's the reverse. I appreciate you, and I, I do want to say to your listeners, Few people have done more to help illuminate and help Americans and others understand how we think about our interests and our role on the stage than you, Aaron. So it's a it's an honor and a thrill for me. I'm a little nervous, you, you know. You're you're live. You're worried that at some point you're going to inadvertently make policy. But I do want to thank you, and I want to commend you for the good work that you've done. And I just I also wanted just to suggest that this is the area. You know, Aaron, we're we're helping your uh, the people who who engage with you understand some of the dynamics of the Indo-Pacific. Anything I can do to help support that, I will. Uh, th Kurt, thanks. Carnegie, thanks you. And uh, again, um, happy, healthy New Year. Thank you, and to you. Thank you, Aaron. Bye bye.